This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. Shelby Foote says civil wars are often the most savage wars, and you can certainly find evidence for that in Bosnia and Rwanda. Foote is an expert on the American Civil War. He became a familiar presence after serving as the principal commentator on the PBS Civil War series. He's the author of a three-volume history of the war. His writing on the Gettysburg campaign has just been republished by the Modern Library under the title Stars in Their Courses. In addition to his historical works, Foote has written six novels, including Love in a Dry Season and Shiloh. He grew up in Greenville, Mississippi, and now lives in Memphis. Foote says our Civil War was unlike the Civil Wars of today. Our Civil War, it seems to me, uh, is exceptional in in many ways. Uh, For one thing, it's commonly said that wars don't settle anything. Uh, That war settled a great many things. And uh, the the others uh, that I have followed don't seem to me ever to settle much. Uh, Revolutions do, but civil wars don't. That's why Southerners wanted to call it a revolution. You've described the Civil War as the central event in our history. Yes. So what I meant by that was it defined our character. Uh, The revolution set us free, gave us the Constitution, gave statements as to what this country was all about with regard to civil liberties and other things. But it was a Civil War that determined which way we were going. One part of the nation was determined not to go the way it seemed to be going by 1860, and the other side wanted to go even further in the direction that the other side did not want it to go. And uh, I seriously doubt that despite our reputation for being able to compromise things, uh, there was really no way to settle this thing except by fighting. Uh, The fact that it went on for four years and cost over a million casualties Uh, was certainly not intended at any point. It just happened so. Uh, It was, however, as Robert Toombs said, a a war between one form of society and another form of society. What what personal meaning has the Civil War had for you? And I assume it has to have some because you spent about 20 years of your life writing your your series of books about the Civil War. Well, I'm from Mississippi, and uh, Southerners uh, tend to... uh, be more interested in that war than the rest of the nation. Part of that psychological, too, if you look back on your youth, uh, if you're a man anyhow, uh, the the fights you remember that you got in were the ones you lost. You remember those best, and of course the South got about as thoroughly defeated as any nation, if it could call itself that, has ever been defeated. And we're not apt to forget that, nor are we apt to forget what followed it. Uh, Reconstruction was about as far opposite from something like the Marshall Plan, as you can get. You use the word we. Do you think of yourself as personally having lost the war? Do you feel a a personal part of that? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that's inescapable, too. Uh, You are where you came from. If I'd been a young man in 1861 and the war had started, no matter how much I was opposed to slavery, no matter how much I saw the right on the other side and the wrong on my side, I still would have gone with my people. Why? It, it's, uh, it, it, it's, you are that people, and uh, you can formulate against it and everything else, but when it comes down to choosing sides, uh, you go with your people. There are people who didn't, and uh, I respect their choice, but for the most part, uh, you do that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a form of patriotism, narrowed down. Do you have relatives who fought in the Civil War and whose stories were handed down as you were growing up? Yes, my, my grandfather uh, commanded the Knox Ruby Cavalry at Shiloh, for instance, and served through the war. Uh, it, it's a very close relationship. Other members of my family were in it, in Boxdale's Brigade at Gettysburg, for instance, so that I take a particular interest in uh, those things when I touch them. I've been on battlefields with various people, and the invariable thing you get whether they're Northerners or Southerners. They want to say, where were the Georgia troops? Where were the Iowa troops? They they feel that that, that strong connection. Well, let's let's get to the Battle of Gettysburg, which is the subject of your new book, Stars and Their Courses. This was the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. Would you give us a sense of the losses? Well, uh, there was a total of about over 150,000 men on that field, well over 150,000. In fact, it was about 165,000. 
but uh, the casualties were just about exactly 50,000, uh, slightly more Confederates than Northerners. Uh, the Confederates lost about 28,000, and the North lost about 23,000, somewhere in there. Why were the losses so great? The losses were so great because they fought by old-style tactics with very modern weapons. The rifle that was used in that war was as accurate, as hard-hitting, and in some way even more deadly than our modern uh, Garand or, or Springfield. It was accurate at a range of two to 300 yards, whereas the tactics had been designed for a smooth-bore musket, mu musket whose accuracy was <laughs> maybe 30 yards at the most. And they believed that the mash of fire, you had to mash your men in attacking. So they lined up shoulder to shoulder, marched against the position, and of course got blown away time after time after time. Pickett's charge is just the biggest example of it. There were plenty of others. So uh, really, if you were a soldier in that battle, uh, you knew if you were toward the front, you were going to die, period, right? There was a very good chance that you would die. Uh, casualties ran very high in Pickett's division. Perhaps uh, it was at least 60 percent of those men were casualties or were captured. Have you often tried to put yourself in that position of, of a soldier who was in the front lines? Uh, I, I, I not only have tried, I have. Uh, I have um, made that advance across that field, uh, had the emotions I hope that those men had, uh, and I'm still uh, marveling at how men could do that. The simplicity of those men, in the best sense, was what enabled to do it. That and unit pride. In the Civil War, both on the northern side and the southern side, uh, groups, whole regiments, came from definite regions of a state, and company would be from a particular town. So you had a loyalty to each other, which meant that if you refused to go, you were letting down these people that you'd fought the war with up till then, and you'd be going home, those of you who survived, and everybody in that little town would know what you had done when you refused to go. It would have taken more nerve not to go than it would to go. Have you also wondered what it must have felt like to be a general responsible for such awesome losses? To me, it's almost impossible to do that. I, I don't know how those men managed it. Uh, it uh, one clue uh, to tell you that they didn't manage it is no victory in that war, except for Vicksburg, where there was a siege and Appomattox, which wound it up these huge battles, the victor was not able to follow up his victory. He was as badly hurt as the defeated side. So that in battle after battle, he would win these great victories like Chancellorsville or Fredericksburg uh, and not be able to pursue the enemy. There was constant criticism for not going into Washington after First Manassas, say. Uh, they were in no condition to go into Washington uh, any more than the army, uh, the enemy army was able to keep them from going into Washington. So you kind of find the general's position unfathomable. Uh, yes, I don't understand how they stood the strain, and in some ways they didn't stand the strain. It must have been, uh, it must have been horrendous for them. Uh, but not only the generals right on down the line, but the command decision to commit men to the kind of slaughter you know was fixing to happen requires a. I don't know what you call it, but it requires something I don't believe I could do. Uh, toward the end of your book about Gettysburg, uh, you describe how, how General Lee took the blame for the defeat at yeah. Gettysburg. It, was it is that a surprising thing? It's not only surprising, it's, it's, it's absolutely unheard of. Uh, every other general I ever heard, especially after a defeat, had all kind of blame to hand around. Th this person didn't do what he's supposed to, and therefore that happened, and so on. Lee walked out on that field, met those men coming back, many of them badly wounded, and said, it is all my fault. I may have asked of you more than men could give. This is my fault. Rally now and help me, help me. It is all my fault. He said it on the field. He said it the next day to Longstreet in a sort of apology for not having taken his advice. He said it in his report to the president and the rest of his life after you would expect all his defensive feelings to come to the front. He still said, it is all my fault. Do you agree with him that it was his fault? I do. I do. Uh, a lot of people don't. They try to put the blame on Longstreet. They do various things because they don't like to speak ill, as they say, of General Lee. 
It is not speaking ill of General Lee. When you understand, this book is called Stars and Its Courses, and that title uh, is the clue to what the book really is about. It's how fate pulled Lee closer and closer and closer to disaster. It was a three-day battle. On the first day, he won a victory that wasn't exploited. On the second day, he almost broke that line. He got up on the ridge and had to pull back. Then on the third day, he said, this is what will do it. And the disaster of Pickett's charge occurred uh, so that he was like uh, Sisera in the Bible. The stars in their courses fought against him. Are you surprised that after a war like the Civil War, the whole nation wouldn't turn into pacifists? <laughs> uh, the nation did turn into something resembling pacifists. Uh, the longest period in our history without a war, I believe, was from about 1865 to 1898 with the Spanish-American War. And you think that's no coincidence? Uh, n not exactly. I think those men had had enough of war and the horror of it. My guest is historian Shelby Foote, and I'm sure you know him from the Civil War series that was on PBS. Uh, there's uh, an, an excerpt of his three-volume history of the Civil War that's just been republished. It's called Stars and Their Courses, and it's about the Gettysburg Campaign. Let's take a short break, and then we'll talk some more. This is Fresh Air. Back with novelist and historian Shelby Foote. His latest book is about the Gettysburg Campaign. It's called Stars in Their Courses. H how much did you grow up with the Civil War? I'm wondering even if, if like, you think your view of, um, of, say, Lincoln was different than people in the North growing up, uh, learning their history. Yes, that was in a different time. I'm 77 years old, so we're talking about the 1930s. Uh, as a schoolboy, I learned obscene dog rule about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there was a vilification of Yankees in general. Uh, it, it was a very different attitude, and I'm glad. My son now, who's 32, he doesn't believe any such thing ever happened, that there was that kind of feeling, were and, there, I, and I'm glad. Were there things you learned that you later had to unlearn? Many things I had to unlearn, many, many things I had to unlearn. Uh, I had to unlearn uh, the belief that the southern planter uh, made and ruled the earth for the earth's own good. It's not true. They were exploitive, bad, crunchy people, almost as bad as the robber barons up, up the country. I'm curious about your own experience with war, since you've written so much about war. I know you served in Europe during World War II as a field artillery captain. W were you ever romantic about war? Uh... Yes, I think we were all somewhat romantic about war until we were exposed to the horror of it. Um, I think it's necessary to be somewhat romantic about war if you're going to engage in it uh, or you run the other way as hard as possible. So what, um, what were some of the early sobering experiences you had on the battlefield? I was never under fire on the battlefield. I was a captain of artillery and got in a terrible argument with a colonel in the artillery thing and got sent home and joined the Marine Corps and served for a year and didn't get in combat there because they dropped a bomb just as I was about to cross the Pacific. Uh, but I got to know the Army, and uh, believe me, it's a very valuable experience when you have to deal with the politics of the military and have to understand the command structure. Even as simple a thing as knowing close order drill and the manual of arms are a big help to you when you start writing about war. You mentioned you were sent home. You were actually court-martialed, I believe, for visiting your girlfriend in Belfast. That's right. Well, why did you do it? I mean, I, I, I can only assume you knew you weren't supposed to be doing that. Well, I did. Many people around me did. It was this uh, colonel who was out to get me, and that's army politics. Uh, I belonged to a battalion that was 54 miles from Belfast, and uh, there was a division order that... Uh, vehicles were not to be used for recreation beyond a distance of 50 miles, and we commonly made our trip tickets out as 49 miles. I made mine out as 49 miles and was charged with falsifying a government document. So everybody was doing that? Right. 
Were you upset to be court-martialed, and did you think that this was going to be a permanent block on your record that would ruin your life? Uh, yes, I had some of that feeling. I, I was in despair. Uh, I, I felt very guilty about not having measured up to what was required of me, including getting along with an unreasonable man, uh, and that was a bad scene. However, I came on home, uh, worked for about four to six months for Associated Press in New York there on the city desk, and couldn't take it any longer and went down and joined the Marine Corps. That was in January of 45. And uh, went through Paris Island boot camp. My fellow recruits uh, used to have a lot of fun with me saying, I understand you used to be a captain in the Army. You might make a pretty good Marine private. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a lot of fun with me. What? But I liked the Marine Corps. I liked uh, a lot of things about it. Why did you go back for more? It's, uh, it has to do with the same thing I joined in the first place. I didn't want something that big going on in the world without being part of it. I also had this uh, regional thing about when something like that comes along, you engage. Now, now what led you toward writing a Civil War history? I, I know an editor suggested that you do it, but editors suggest lots of things that people don't follow through on. There had to be more than that. Uh, I was born and raised in Greenville, Mississippi, and lived there while writing the first five novels. Then I'd reached a point where I wanted to pause and then write another series of five novels. And about that time, Bennett Cerf, then the head of Random House, asked if I would be willing to write a short history of the Civil War. And it seemed like a good thing to do during this period of gestation for uh, be a good occupation. And after all, I had to do something to make a living. So I said I would. And I sat down to outline it and did outline it pretty thoroughly and saw as soon as I got halfway through the outline that I was not interested in the little resume of the war. So I wrote to Bennett and told him uh, <clears throat> I'd be glad to do it, but I'd have to go spread eagle whole hog on the thing, and it would run three volumes. <clears throat> and they had some kind of meeting up the country and uh, said, okay, go ahead. So I did for the next 20 years. Um one of the controversies now about American history has to do with a, a Disney history theme park that's uh, in the works for uh, Virginia. And you're one of the historians who's spoken out against this theme park. What, what are your problems with it? Uh, I have the problems that uh, are most strongly emphasized that I don't think that area ought to be desecrated in that particular way. That area of Virginia? That area of Virginia is called the Piedmont. It's a beautiful region, and many, many important historical things happened there, not only the Civil War, but all the way back, but most especially the Civil War. Uh, Haymarket is less than five miles from Manassas, where two great battles were fought, and the overflow from the Disney Park will uh, have a profound effect on that region around Prince William County. Incidentally, some of my people came from there. There was a house named Waverly right near Haymarket. It's not there anymore, but my people live there, so that I, I don't like being called an outsider. Incidentally, they didn't call my forebears outsiders when they went up and fought in the Army in Northern Virginia. But uh, my main objection to it, in addition to that, and with me more sharp, is uh, Disney tends to sentimentalize anything he touches. Uh, chipmunks are bright little creatures instead of little things that'll bite your fingers. Uh, mice scurry around, uh, all that. And as long as it's fantasy, I have no objection. I grew up with Mickey Mouse and enjoyed all of them. But I want him to let history alone. I don't want him to do what was done to Davy Crockett. I don't want uh, false history sentimentalized history to be presented to our children as the way of getting them engaged in history. I don't believe in the false thing being a good way to get people attracted toward a good thing. You know, uh, syndicated columnist William Sapphire has said that it's, it's intellectually arrogant to block the construction on the grounds that it might misinterpret the past. He says if historians disagree, they're obliged to denounce fuzzy interpretations and rebut the rewriting of history, but they shouldn't try to stop the theme park. Uh, I, I, I'm aware that arrogance comes pretty close to being a mortal sin, but I don't at all mind being intellectually arrogant against something that I'm opposed to in an intellectual way, such as Disney establishing a park that's going to tell our young people what American history was. You know, it, you could easily make the argument that so few young people are learning anything about history or, or interested at all in history that... Uh, 
it would be a good thing to have a, an entertaining theme park approach to learning something about history. It would depend on what that park was, and uh, I really am opposed to sentimentalizing history. Sentimentalizing a thing is the greatest sin you can make where art is concerned, and I would be opposed to it on that ground as in any case. I would almost rather think I knew absolutely nothing about history than to have what I consider a false sense of history. Uh, I'm leaning too heavily on that, but it happens to be I'm hipped on a subject that I don't even mind being arrogant about it, as we say. What if you consider sentimentality to be such a great sin? It's a falsification. Uh, sentimentalists, uh, when they weep, their tears aren't even salty. They don't suffer. They don't see pain because they know that pain's going to be alleviated. Uh, in in uh, Disney productions, the good are going to come out absolutely triumphant and happy. The evil are going to get what's coming to them. Uh, life is not like that, and I don't think people should be taught that life is like that. Uh, incidentally, the old fairy tales, Grimm and Anderson, they're not like that. Um, were you excited by history when you were young? Not in school. school. History was very badly taught. I think one of the reasons is teachers want to teach in a way that they can grade. So you have to memorize the 13 steps of the Treaty of Utrecht, and they can give you a grade on that. You either got 71% or 82%. And if they ask you a discussion question, they don't know how to grade it. They've got the great burden of having to read it. And I think that's one of the reasons for it, including lack of skill in teaching. It's not easy to teach history. Uh, it takes somebody who understands it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, Americans who are Civil War buffs who, who's, whose hobby is collecting Civil War memorabilia mm -hmm. and um, uh, other things along those lines. And I, I wonder what you make of that. I've never been interested much in uh, memorabilia, many balls and <clears throat> gold buttons and things like that. But they get a great kick out of it, and the reenactors learn a lot of history. There's a great deal of insistence on authenticity among reenactors, and I like that. I've only been to one full-scale uh, reenactment that was shallow on the 125th anniversary, and I really enjoyed it. It was great to see. Shelby Foote. His writing about the Gettysburg campaign is published in a new modern library edition called The Stars in Their Courses. <laughs>